Chapter 5, Black Biscuit Barbecue, April, May 2002. At the end of April, I went to Tucson to be with my family for a few days. Jack's t-ball team was doing well and having fun. Gwen was running the house like an easygoing quartermaster, and Dale played her used guitar. She wanted a new one. I told her to keep at it for a little longer. I said that when Gwen and I thought she was dedicated, we'd get it for her, a Gibson or whatever else was best. She said, okay, Daisy, our lazy hound dog, alternated between sleeping on a pad under the veranda and barking into the desert brush, warning rattlers, gila monsters, and roadrunners to keep their distance. I did yard work, cleaned the pool, and patched a spot on the roof. It was warm enough to be outside at night, and we ate dinner on the back porch. A week later, I headed back to Phoenix to meet with Joseph Slats to tell him. He called to ask if I'd be interested in joining him on his Hells Angels case. We'd never worked together, but our wives were friends, so we knew each other socially. Where I was regarded as an accomplished undercover, Slats was renowned as a major case guru. He worked in Detroit in the 80s and 90s, the Vietnam Federal Law Enforcement, and Phoenix and Miami after that. He recently returned to Phoenix and had been looking for a challenge commensurate with his driving skills. We met at the Waffle House at Baseline in I-10. We both had pecan waffles with fried eggs and sausage and hot coffee. The place smelled like a tar pit brimming with bacon dripping, syrup, and industrial strength cleaners. He said he'd be keeping tabs on Operation Riverside, that Sugar Bear and I were doing good work. I said his case in Phoenix sounded promising. He bit into a juicy sausage. Grease dripped down his fork and chin. Just got a hell of a lot more promising. Those fucks fucked up at Laughlin. I sopped up egg yolks with a wedge of waffle. He drank his coffee and continued saying the Hells Angels had played their hand and played it wrong. That they'd practically forced us to step up to the plate and take a swing at the world's baddest, most infamous OMG. I put down my coffee mug. I knew he was right. I said, so, so, so what are you talking about here? You're in a unique position. He took a forkful of hash browns and swirled them in a pile of ketchup and Tabasco sauce. Riverside is on autopilot. You're going to make a good case there. I'd love to have both of you come on. You'd be the lead you see for the whole thing and Sugar Bear could run the northern end of the op. I can only speak for myself, but that sounds damn tempting. He stuffed the hash browns into his mouth. He spoke before swallowing. So, you'll do it? You'll come on board with me? Dude, say the word and I'm there. I could hardly believe I was about to be working with Joseph Statala. I wasn't so much starstruck as I was excited. I knew that if we put in the hours, we'd have a legacy maker of a case. Good, he signaled to the waitress, who looked like she'd rather be playing Pinochle. I asked, what's the plan? Before answering, Slash asked the waitress for a Diet Coke with lemon. He watched her walk away. Then he turned to me with a wise smile and said, Oh, don't worry. You'll love it. Slats put the team together and we got underway in late May. Working undercover with me would be ATF Special Agent Carlos Canino, an old friend and partner we got a loan from, the Miami field office, and veteran Phoenix Police Detective Billy Timmy Long. In addition, two different informants would work with us. The first was Rudy Kramer, a confidential informant Slats had flipped. The second was a man simply known as Pops, a 50-something paid informant and ex-street hustler who I'd worked with many times. I met Pops in 1996 through investigators working with the Air Force's Office of Special Investigations, OSI. Pops worked as a traditional confidential informant in those days, exchanging legal leniency for information. Pops helped the OSI with the home invasion crew, a band of robbers who targeted residential homes that included an Air Force officer. At the time, Pops was heavily involved in meth. He was a tweaker whose life could easily have ended in prison or a ditch. The OSI case went well, and after he took care of his legal problems, never having to serve any time, Pops started doing informer for hire work for the Arizona Department of Public Safety. His work was good, but he was inconsistent and he had trouble staying clean. He was recommended to me, but before we could work together, I had to lay down the law. I told him I wouldn't tolerate drug use and that if I found out he lied to me or anything about the case, I'd cut him loose. He agreed to the terms and it was the start of a unique relationship. Over the course of several cases, I groomed Pops into a skilled operative. 
He learned to remember license plates, addresses, gun serial numbers, and names from utility bills. He became an excellent note taker, emptying his brain of details as soon as the opportunity arose. He was as good as the aspects of the job, if not better, than most agents. He worked entirely for money, and initially, money was his sole motivation. But over time, he grew to enjoy working for the good guys. He dug the jazz and rush of running a good scam on bad people. Eventually, I came to trust him as much as I trusted any of the other men or women I worked with. I introduced him around, and he got hired onto other investigations, always coming away with high praise and improved skills. By the time I'd asked him to join me on Black Biscuit, he was making a living working exclusively as a paid informant. When I told Slats I wanted Pops, he asked why. I said, this guy knows the meth game from the street up. He's not a one percenter, but he knows these guys in ways we simply can't. He wouldn't be faking. Do you trust him? Enough to let him carry a piece? Yes, I trust him like he's one of us. I'll have to meet him, but okay, go talk to him. I did. I went to Pop's place in Tucson. He lived there with his wife and two whip-smart girls and asked him if he wanted to work a big case for me. Hell yes, he said. I gave him the details. He said he was game to play a big role. I told him I couldn't give him that, that he'd just be an associate. I didn't make any bones about it. You'll get 500 a week, no overtime, plus expenses. You're going to make runs to Mexico for us. Agents can't go down there. You'll be traveling with another, less trusted informant. Make sure he stays in line. As always, you're our drug guy. You know the shit better than we do. And if there ever comes a time when one of us needs to take a bump or a puff, when we got no dodge or escapes left, then you gotta come to the rescue and be that guy. All right, think you can handle that without getting hooked again? Jay, I hooked that shit again. I'm telling you now to go ahead and arrest me when it happens. That or shoot me, it won't happen. Good. In addition to the undercover crew, Slats put together a stellar task force, staff of cops, from a broad spectrum of agencies, ATF, the Phoenix, Glendale, and Tempe Police Departments, the Arizona Department of Public Safety, the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office, and the Drug Enforcement Agency, all contributed. Put together, the task force members had over 200 years of law enforcement or military training and experience. Slats couldn't persuade Sugar Bear to come on board. He opted to see the Riverside case to the end. He eventually arrested all of the guys in that case and sent them each away for quite a while. Every case gets a code name. We wanted something mysterious. The Sonny Barger investigation or the Arizona Hells Angels didn't have any pop. We also needed a name that would help keep the case hush hush. Undercover work cuts both ways. We try to get in on them and one way or another, they try to get in on us. There are plenty of cops who are buddy buddy with the angels or angel associates. And the angels have plenty of friends, usually wives or girlfriends, who work for state or municipal offices. For those reasons, we needed to keep our case on the down low. Slats was a huge Detroit Wings fan, so he decided to call our case Black Biscuit, which is slang for hockey puck. We were ready to go. The Saturday before the day-to-day -day operations were to commence, Slats had a barbecue at his place. His wife cooked up a feast. Everyone was invited, including wives and kids. Making a weekend of it, Gwen and I checked into a hotel and left the kids with the grandparents. At the party, we laughed and drank beer and sweated in the Stylus backyard. It was a blissful state of communal denial. At the height of the party, Slats made his way through the crowd asking people to come inside. Gwen and I were chatting with Carlos, who was there alone when Slats came up to us. We followed him and on the way he threw out an empty beer can, grabbed a dripping fresh one out of an ice bucket and snapped it open. Once inside, he took his wife by the arm and climbed a few steps leading to the bedroom upstairs. He turned around. Friends, everyone, please. You may think otherwise, but I'm not much for speeches. I just want to thank you all for coming. This meal we've made for you is a very small token of appreciation for what you are about to undertake. This is going to be a long haul. It'll take nearly all our time and energy. Make no mistake. No one has done what we are about to do in the kind of way we intend to do it. It's going to take all the brains and balls and heart that each of us has. He paused to take a long swig of beer. I got to warn all of you. This is going to be a shit detail. Slat's wife nudged him for cussing around the kids. He continued, the work will be big and good. 
but the damned will be high. So I'm here to say now that if any of you or your families have any reservations about being involved, then please, with my blessing and understanding, say so now and walk away. He paused. Silence. I raised my hand. Fuck it, Joe. I'm out. Everyone laughed. Joe said, all right then, I'll see you on Monday. Enjoy the last free Sunday of your foreseeable futures.